coral is. Why is it flying? Flying indicates its function because it's going to be about judgment. So it's going to be a rapid judgment by God. And it's going to be on individual houses, you'll note this, of thieves and perjurers. Its length, and I'll put it in today's measurements of the scroll, 4.5 metres by 9.1 metres. And these, by the way, were the dimensions of the holy place in the tabernacle. So we're getting some other information here. And, and it's the measurement of the porch of Solomon's temple. Now remember, we had already one symbol last time we gathered taken from in the holy place. That was the menorah, the lampstand. We have one here. And it's about the judgment of sin that God is going to bring to Israel and the other nations leading to His second coming. We are not judged as to sin by our own measures. We do that in our minds. We say, well, gee, that person's a lot worse than I am. That person deserves judgment. I mean, his sin is not as bad as my sin. And our sins are never as bad as anybody else's, are they? Well, we can't judge ourselves. We don't have that measure. And we're not weighed <coughs> by our own false balances. Oh, well, as they do in Israel at the moment, you know, on the Day of Atonement, they don't have the sacrifice at the moment. So they weigh up the year. I've had, you know, a closer year to God than, than the bad things I've done can't do that either. The grandson of Nebuchadnezzar tried to do that and Daniel told him he'd been weighed up and found wanting when the handwriting was on the wall. But the measure of the sanctuary, the holy place of God, is that which man's actions are to be weighed. And so God, we, we, we have a, a wonderful understanding of God's grace, but we must also be aware that God's grace is also God's holiness. And that we don't just serve a forgiving God. Ah, she's all right. That's all right. No, don't worry about wicking at sin. You know, nah, no problems. That's all right. Everyone can go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Otherwise, Jesus' death on the cross was to no avail. Sin had to be judged. The wages of sin is death. Be sure your sins will find you out. And so here... We have this background, this coloring of this vision that tells us the Holy God of Israel is going to judge His people and the world heading towards a millennium before He returns and sets up His rule. There was to be a cleansing of the actual land of Israel, not just the people. That's why the land of Israel, the very dirt of Israel, it's not just dirt like we look at, it's God's holy land. Verse 3 and 4, we see the scroll represents judgment that will come and must come before the blessing of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of when Jesus returns and then sets up a thousand-year reign and rules the world with you and I. It says, every thief shall be expelled. <clears throat> that is, every perjurer shall be expelled. This indicates that the text on the scroll, as Zechariah sees it, contains the Ten Commandments, the law. Because the law is what judges us, isn't it? To steal was to injure your neighbor. To perjure, to lie was to dishonor God because you had sworn in His name. And here the Lord says, I will send out the curse. The two sins, one from each side of the tablets of the Ten Commandments, represent all of Israel's sin. And God will curse the people who commit these sins in their house. Two of the commandments are mentioned. Let's read. Then I turned and raised my eyes, and I saw there a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I said, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, its width 10 cubits. And then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. So it's going to be a worldwide judgment, but it begins initially 
in Israel. Every thief shall be expelled. According to this side of the scroll, every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. Notice the wording here is quite dramatic, quite pointed. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with its timbers and stones. The Ten Commandments, representing all of Israel's sin, judgment comes. And two of the commandments are especially mentioned. The eighth, which is stealing. The third, which is swearing falsely in the name of the Lord. And it's interesting because you remember the Ten Commandments were written on two tablets of stone. And in the middle of each of those two tablets was the third commandment and the eighth commandment. So no doubt as Zechariah sees this image, this flying scroll, he's seeing the whole of the commandments of God. Now remember, the law, many people say, well, you know, what sort of relationship do you have with God? Oh, well, I, you know, live by the, the golden rule and, you know, the commandments of God. And if you ask them to name them, they can't name them. And uh, the law is not meant and can't save you. But instead, it was the schoolmaster, Paul said, pointed that this is your shortcoming. It was to reveal that we need a saviour, Jesus, to save us and redeem us. Because the law judges us and we are rightly judged. We've broken the law. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. Can't save you. Well, I, I live a good life. No, you don't. You're breaking the law. No deeds, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. It just tells you where you've where you're wrong in every area. But why did the Lord choose these two commandments to mention? That's the question I, I have. Don't you have when you were, well, yeah, but why does he mention these two? Stealing and swearing falsely. Questions come up to us then. Remember, these are the people, and God's going to bring judgment to the nation Israel. These are the people who have returned under Zerubbabel. Joshua is the high priest. They've returned back to Israel. They've been born in Babylon. They've come to Israel. Joshua is to, to help them. They're rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city. They're spiritually lacking in knowledge of what to do, and Joshua's job is to help them in that way. Zerubbabel is to guide them and to build them back. But why were these two commandments especially mentioned to this group who'd returned back to Israel with the Jewish people stealing from God by not being faithful in their giving to the Lord. Malachi dealt with that. You're robbing God. Tithes and offerings. Wherein have we robbed God? Tithes and offerings. And then lying about it. Well, how are we, how are we, how are we robbing you? Tithes and offerings. The prophet Malachi accused them of that very thing. The prophet Haggai rebuked the people at this time for putting their own interests ahead of the Lord's work. He says, your house is really great. The temple, it's in ruins. What's the deal? Everything at your place is smick. The Lord's house, terrible. Remember, Haggai and Malachi were at the same time as Zechariah. God announced on the flying scroll he would visit the individual homes in the land, judge those who were deliberately disobeying God and breaching His law. Sin is serious to a holy God. Ultimately, taking a step back, we know that God will judge, and, and we kind of forget this. That's why we need to pray 
That's why the time is short. That's why we need to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Ultimately, we know that God will judge every sinner. It's appointed unto man what? Once to die, and then what? Judgment. And there is no automatic default, even though the world thinks that, even though the, the, the devil has told them that lie, well, everyone's going to go to heaven. As I said, when you, if you've been to a funeral, where is everybody? Uncle Tom, Uncle Jack, Auntie Mary, they're all there when so-and-so, they're all now with them in where? And they bring out heaven even though they've had nothing to do with God whatsoever. No one ever says, oh, well, they're, you know, old Bill, he's just gone to annihilation. He doesn't exist anymore. He's just, now old Bill is with everybody else because that's, that's been planted in our hearts by the Lord, eternity. But we've sinned the book of Jude, Jude picks this up in verse 14 and 15. It says, Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying, and it fits in the time, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of His saints. When's that? Revelation 19, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the beginning of the millennium, to execute judgment, and hear this wording from Jude, on all to convict all all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, everything will be picked up, which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But God will start with Israel. That's what Zechariah is seeing here. It's a divine principle that judgment begins with God's people. It obviously is a scroll that represents the Word of God. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. Peter picks it up in 1 Peter 4, 17 about the church as well. For the time has come for judgment to begin where? At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 3, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. The whole world will be judged. That is the whole land of Israel, he's speaking here, specifically first of all. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll. Every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. You shall enter the house of the thief and the house of of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with his timber and stones. Remember Achan, when he was judged? It wasn't just like, hey, Achan, you over there, you were just, no, remember? Everyone step back, step back. And everything with Achan, he's, everything, all his belongings, judged. That's the judgment that's coming. This will occur before Jesus establishes His kingdom before the millennium on earth and the Holy Land, Israel as we know it, will truly become holy. God gives us more detail in verses 6 to 11 because God's going to remove the wickedness from the land of Israel. And so we have this vision now of the woman and the basket. Some of your Bibles will have the old name Ephah. Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, lift your eyes now and see what is this that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? He said, it's a basket that is going forth. But he also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up and this is a woman sitting inside the basket. So it's a big one. Then he said, this is wickedness, pointing to the woman. And he thrust her down into the basket, put the lid cover the lead cover over its mouth to stop the woman getting out. So what is this picture? What is this vision? The basket represented the iniquity of the people throughout the land, wickedness. Not only will individual sins and sinners be judged, their houses, as we've just read, because the Hebrew word for wickedness is feminine, it says of this woman. This vision 
is a continuation of judgment upon the sin and iniquity of Israel. It looks forward to the millennium, the return of Christ, when sin and iniquity will be removed from the Holy Land. Also, it looks forward to the judgment, and here we bring in Babylon, which will precede the millennium. Revelation chapter 17 and 18, religious and commercial, Babylon. When does Jesus come? Revelation 19. The judgment of religious commercial Babylon, then the return and establishment of the thousand-year reign by Jesus. It's a basket that's going forth. The basket was an ephah. It had a lead disc, and there were units of measurement and symbols of commerce in those days. The ephah, you weigh it up, this is how much it is, it's worth this. But no ephah or basket was big enough for a person to be placed in. This was a special basket. Here Zechariah sees in this vision the woman trying to get out of the basket. The woman, wickedness. So a heavy lead lid cover was placed on it to keep her in. This is their resemblance throughout the earth. The NIV translates this. This is the iniquity of the people throughout the land. This is wickedness. The woman the basket and the weight are associated with wickedness. They personify these things. Greed, materialism, connected to Babylon, hold that thought, and dishonesty for profit. In other words, ripping people off purely for gain. What did the returning Jews bring to their land from Babylon? commercialism. Initially, the Jews were people of the land. Remember, they hadn't let the land line lie, giving it a Sabbath rest every seventh year. And they were judged for that period of time that they hadn't done it for the time they were taken to Babylon under captivity. But many of the Jews born in Babylon now are returning to Israel had become people of the city. They had become successful merchants. It was the spirit, and I want to qualify this because there's nothing wrong with being a good businessman, and I'll explain that, but it was the spirit of competitive commercialism that was represented by the woman in the ephah, commercial Babylon, the way of the world, money, greed, fame, all that wrapped up in one. Now, back in the book of Genesis, chapter 10, verse 10, we mention Babylon the first time under this fellow called Nimrod. Nimrod, it says, was a mighty hunter. But the hunting that he did was he was a hunter of men's souls. He was a wicked man who forged himself a kingdom at any cost, commercialism, defying the Lord himself in the process. What did he do? Let's build a tower. Where? Into heaven. We'll have the gods our way. We'll go there. And where was it built? In China. Park that in your mind because that's what's going to be mentioned here. The Tower of Babel built in China, and why was it built? As an attempt to exalt man and dethrone God. Well, because God, remember, brought judgment with the languages? You know, if we don't do this, they're going to try and do everything. Babylon, throughout Scripture, symbolizes the world's enmity against God. Revelation 17 and 18. The biblical contrast is you and I, the bride, the church, in the heavenly city. Babylon is the picture of the harlot, wickedness, where? Seated in the earthly city of Babylon. In Revelation 18, 
Babylon has the emphasis is on the commercial success and vast wealth of Babylon. Remember when God judges it and the world looks on it and goes, oh, what a great shame. Oh, look what's happened to everything. We've lost everything. And God has brought judgment on commercial Babylon. It was the Babylonian virus that had infected the Jews during their Babylonian exile and they came back and brought back that virus. But this does not imply that the people of Israel today are guilty of bad business practices or that it is wrong for anybody to earn money by engaging in business. No, that's not what this is about. But if the worldly commercial spirit infects the child of God, it will result in twisted values. You'll put money before your service, your ministry, your family, all the things that you should do. You put this before God. You'll have confusing priorities. We see it in the world today in families, don't we? How many families? Well, I'm doing this because, you know, I, 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 you know and, and, and the, I'm, I'm, so that my kids can have this and this and this. And what their kids need is a mum and a dad. And the world looks at, like, this is what I'm providing. And you're missing the point. It's also the world commercial spirit is a craving for wealth and position that grieves God because it becomes your God. It's the motivating force behind. It's just like, how much money do I need? How much do I have to give? What what do I how do you know what what does it do with my money? That's why today so many scammers are successful because people get sold the free lunch, don't they? Invest this amount and you'll get a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. He who trusts in his riches. Do you trust in your riches? He who trusts in his riches will fall. But the righteous will flourish like foliage. Proverbs twenty eight twenty two. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches. That's all he can see. He does not consider that poverty will come upon him. What is the antidote for being infected with the Babylonian virus of commercialism? Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'll look after everything else. Zechariah prophesied to those who returned from the Babylonian exile. God's people came came back from Babylon with a materialism problem. This vision speaks to this problem. One of the great sins of the Israelites when they returned from Babylon was an insatiable love for money and a desire for material things. It says, He thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead cover over its mouth. God first demonstrates His authority over evil, then removes the wickedness from Jerusalem, which he's going to do. Verse 9 to 11. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of stork, of a stork. And they lifted up the basket, they carry it between earth and heaven. So I said to the angel who talked with me, where, where are they going to take the basket? Notice. And he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of China, where's that? Babylon, the root, the place. The basket will be set there on its base. Where are they carrying the basket? God will cause this evil materialistic spirit to be returned to its starting place, Babylon. And there it will be eventually destroyed. The basket is returned to a specific location to build a house for it in the land of China. It will be here that God will judge Babylon once and for all. You can read about that in Revelation 17 and 18, the massive destruction. The origin of Israel's great sin of past times, idolatry, is now traced to Babylon 
the place where all idolatry, idolatry started in China, Genesis 11, Genesis 11 2. It came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of China, and there they dwelt there. When it is ready, the basket will be set on its base, it says. The word for base here in the Hebrew is the thought of a pedestal where you place an idol, you know? The setting, the idol of materialism where it belongs, in the base in Babylon. Two women, they had wings, like the wings of a stork. This means that the women in Zechariah's vision had big wings, strong enough to take this basket containing this woman back to Babylon. Today, and it's very interesting, we've got to wrap it up. I want you to put your connecting ears and eyes and, and just fathom what, what, what are the big issues of today? Global financial crisis. Interest rates, oil prices, food prices, the economy. This is now new treasurer said, things are only going to get worse. Before he said, we can fix it. Now he says, that's only going to get worse. Today, money has become a god around the world. And like a god, money is worshipped and trusted by people. What for? To give them help. If I just have this, it's all I need is this. To be their saviour. Man, lotto. Man, if I could win lotto, I, that's the end of all my problems. That's the Australian dream, isn't it? Money will solve the problems. If I just had more money, that'll fix our marriage, our kids, our everything else. It will bring happiness. If I just get this, if I had that, we'll be happy. You'll be happy. I'll be happy. We'll all be happy. I've heard people say that. If I just have money, it will give me, you know, a power. I'll be able to do things. You know, go and buy this. No, have that. I'll be able to accomplish all the goals and the drive and the dreams that I have. I just need the money. How many con men, con people who are chasing a dream and saying, I can help you with that. Let me help you with that. The last of the ten commandments is, thou shall not covet. Exodus 20, 17. Covetousness, we don't treat, man, I like we treat all the other sins, oh, but covetous, what? No big deal. We don't mention it, do we? Oh, he's a coveter. She's covet. She's a covetous man. Covetousness will cause people to break the other nine commandments. For the love of money, Paul says, 1 Timothy 16, 16. For the love of money. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You see, the love of money change. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, pierced themselves through, Paul says, with many sorrows. Sold their faith because I'm leaving to do this. If I get the money, it'll fix everything. Ephesians 5 5. For this you know. And here, here the list of sins that no fornicator. Now that's wicked, isn't it? No unclean person. Ooh, wicked. Nor covetous man nor covetous man. We call it white collar, don't we? It's a white collar problem, crime. It means it's not as bad as the other ones. Who is an idolater, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 1 Corinthians 5.11. Hear it again. 
Paul says, but now I've written to you to not keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral. Oh, no, we would never do that. Or covetous. Or an idolater connected again. Or a reviler. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. Not even to eat with such a person. You see, the thing that we're about to face, the church is about to go through, the world is leading to, and it's all part of the big plan by the enemy. Because in the end, his his rule, the white horse rider, the first horseman, will come out, bring peace. He will bring a world system that will solve our economic crisis. You'll have a mark here and a mark there, but you won't be able to buy or sell. What's that got to do with? Commercialism. Unless you follow and worship Him. There's the connection. We need to take the warning of the Word of God as believers that it's God who we trust in. It's God we look to. Not the bank, not our stocks, not our shares. Nothing wrong with being a good businessman. Abraham was. Nothing wrong with that at all. I wish everyone would be a good businessman or woman. But let our trust, our faith, our looking to not be in that, but in the Spirit of God. Let us love Him first. Let us seek Him first. Because we are now entering a time when when the traps are being laid out and people are going to have to choose who they're going to trust. What am I going to put my family's background, you know, what we're going to rest in? Is it the Lord? Or is it the ability to have this bag of money to make everything right? Father, we thank you for your word. We ask for you now to give us wisdom as we gather to pray one for another and for the needs of the church, Lord. Lord, let us always look to you. Let us seek you first in your kingdom. Let us not be ensnared by the ways of the world for the love of money, Lord. Let that not be named amongst us. Let us not have the sin of covetousness, Lord, at all, please. Keep us from that. We pray and ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.